I invite you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you for your tender care for each and every one of us. Lord, you've heard requests about little things, lost checks, big things, health concerns, Lord. But now we come to you, Lord, asking that you would open our hearts to receive spiritual things, that we might be drawn close to you, that we might be changed into what you would have us to be. Be with my mind and with my mouth, that all will be said and done for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. December 22, 1995. It was a Monday morning. 6.31 a.m. to be exact. Perfect child was born. She scored 10 out of 10 on her Atgar test. She was gorgeous. Word spread around the hospital. Floor started... Getting lots of visitors, nurses came to see this child. She resembled her mother, but she had her father's nose and smile. And yet, she was unique. And I made her. Well, sort of. I contributed 23 chromosomes. Her mother tw contributed 23 chromosomes to make 46 chromosomes to create a perfect child unique and the thing that I remember most is in addition to having this sense of awe when I held her in my arms and I called her name she responded by opening one eye and scanning the room and then the second eye and when she figured it was safe she opened both her eyes and the first thing she saw was my face whether that was good or bad don't know but from her perspective, in the beginning, there was dad. She had heard my voice before she had ever seen my face because of our in vitro conversations. And when she was born, the first image she ever registered in her brain was my face. And from that cold December morning until now, she has only experienced a world where dad exists. You open your Bibles this morning and you are confronted with the seven, sorry, ten most important words, seven in Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim ve'et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. I'm going to give the kids some words, to, some drawings to do. But have you ever considered this? Why begin the Bible this way? It is unique to the Christian Bible. If you begin, if you open the Quran, it begins by a praise to, to Allah, most merciful God. And it continues in the second chapter by talking about the state of those who believe and those who don't believe. And you had to read quite a while to figure out this most basic human question. Where did we come from? How did we get here? Now, I believe that the reason that God opens the Bible in this way is because God wants to state from the onset that he is unlike any other God. He says in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6, he says, I I'm the Lord, and beside me there is no God. Now, this is for the kids only, not, not for you, you adults. I'm going to teach you two words today in Hebrew. And if you know these two words, you know one-third of the Bible. Just two words, okay? And it says, Vayomer Elohim. Two words that means, and God said. The Bible says that in the beginning, God.
That means God. That's God. Your kids can draw that. But for the adults and the kids, what's the first thing we learn when we open and we read that first text? In the beginning, God. We are confronted with this reality that God is eternal. You see, in Scripture, there's no backstory to God. You open and you are confronted with the reality that God was there in the beginning. Paul, writing to Timothy, says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So when you and I open the Bible, we are faced with the inspired word that poses us a question to us. Do I believe that statement? Now, I don't presume that everyone here believes that statement, but I do. What about y'all? Now, I want to take a look at these seven words. See, because the first thing we learn about God, like I said before, is that he is, what? Eternal. Throughout scripture, God reminds us of his eternal nature. If you turn to uh, Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God makes a covenant with Noah and the earth. And he says in verse, I believe it is verse 16, 15 and 16. It says, And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall, be no, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon him, look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting, what, what kind of covenant? Everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, if God is not eternal, he just made himself a liar. Because he said that he would look upon it and remember the covenant that he has made. When it rains, do you still see the cloud, the bow in the cloud? Were you there at the flood? Is God still here? Amen. So, God makes a covenant, an everlasting covenant. He continues. When Moses is in the desert and he says to God or to the bush, well, let me back up. Moses is in the desert. He has an encounter with God via a burning bush. He continues and God reveals himself to him. And Moses asked God a question. He said, what is your name? What, who should I tell them I have met with when I go back to Egypt? And what does God say? God says, tell them that I am that I am have sent thee. I am who I am and who I always will be because I was always who I was, have sent thee. In writing Psalms 90, Moses says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, for even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Isaiah puts it this way. In Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, he says, I am God. And there is none like me. And this is what makes God unique. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. That's Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. John, his beloved disciple, writing his letter, his gospel, he begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And this was John's mantra. When he wrote the book of Revelation, he begins by saying, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. John closes the book by reminding us that God is eternal. God wants us to believe right from the very beginning that he has always existed. You see, because it was only someone who had always existed that could tell Moses the condition of the earth before he had formed it. It says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, right there in the beginning, in that first verse, let's go back there again. So we see that in the beginning, God, God existed. And then it says God created. What does that mean? God created. So that you can have some to study at home a little later. And that's a Hebrew word. It's, uh, you can find it in your Strong's Concordance 1254. Bara. And it means, or to say it this way, in scripture, you can search through your Bible, whenever you see the word created from this word, it only always has one subject, God. Because you and I are incapable of this. Because that implies inherently creation out of nothing. You see, when we read the, 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 the creation account, there's no mention of any raw materials. I know quite a few people here have built houses, right? But you didn't say, let there be house, and there was house. You didn't say, let there be wood, and Lord delivered it to you. But we start with raw materials. But God is not like us. He doesn't need the things that we do in order to do what he does. You see, this idea of create... It's something that the psalmist recognized that only God could do. When David writes in Psalm 51, as he repents of his sins, verse 10, David cries out, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, can you create a clean heart within yourself? You've been trying? Tell the truth. And we fail because to, the ability to create is not within us, not in that sense. So we see this is why scripture says that there is nothing that was made that was not made by him and by him all things consist. So let's take a closer look at what God explicitly, what scripture explicitly records God as having created. What are the, God created, what well, about one, two, three. Six things, according to the Bible, explicitly. Kids, can you tell me any, 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 anything that you know that God created, explicitly that God created? Animals, yes. God created the heaven and the earth. He didn't just create any kind of animals. On the fifth day, God created the animals from the sea and birds of the ear. He doesn't use that word when he refers to cattle and beasts and creeping things. But he uses that word when he refers to man and woman. So God created the heavens and the earth. He created creatures, great whales and every living creature that moves in the waters. He creates every winged fowl after its kind, and he created man and woman in his image. You can find that in verse 1, verse 21, and verse 27. Now, God made some things. See, because he created and he made. Now, some of the things that God made. God made a firmament. God made two great lights, the stars. He made the beast of the earth, the cattle, and creeping thing. 
I must also mention here that God made a woman. Genesis 2 and verse 22. Now, women are a unique order of creation, man. See, when God says God made a woman, he didn't use the same word that he used for making cattle and for making the sun and the moon and the stars. He used a word that means to build, to construct. This means that the woman was built or constructed. What an amazing construction. Amen. In Genesis 2, 7, we learn that God formed a man of the dust of the ground. And the forming of a man is, is also a characteristic that is unique to God. It is something that is described in scripture as a potter with the clay. But th this idea of making... When God says in Genesis 1.26, let us make man, he uses the word asa, which is the Hebrew word, for those of you who go home and, and look in your concordance, is the Hebrew word, uh, I believe is 62.13. You can look it up in your Strong's concordance. But asa means to, to do an activity, to perform an activity with a specific purpose in mind. So why is that important? Because I want you to understand this morning that when God said, let us, let us make man, it was not an afterthought. It was not something that caught him by surprise. He created man as he was forming man of the dust of the earth. He had a specific purpose for man in mind. And there are some of you here this morning that need to be reminded that you are not an accident. You are not here because of somebody's poor lifestyle choice or any such thing but you are here because God had a plan and a specific purpose when your father met your mother God had a specific purpose with you in mind and you know that purpose that God had in mind for us was this he said let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the things that he created And, you know, it's amazing to me that the image of God is a man and a woman, collectively. But yet, individually, a man and a woman are also unique representatives of God, revealing that God is not, God has many aspects. There are many aspects of, God, of God's nature. In other words, you and I, are here by divine directive. Yes, you and I are the intended creation of a God who knows the end from the beginning. Now let's go on to verse 3 and 4 of Gen 3 to 5 of Genesis. Now think about this for a minute. What do we read in verse 3? And it said, God said, let there be light and there was light. God spoke light into existence. Psalms 33, 6 to 9 tells us that by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, right? In verse 9 of Psalms 33, it says that by he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. But have you ever considered for a moment that when God said, let there be light, he was not speaking of the sun and the moon, and the stars. That didn't come until day four. So whatever it was that God created at day one, this light was not the sun and the moon, but it was enough that on that day that God created light, God created time. God created time. He created a day, a period consisting of an evening and a morning. How many kids here like math? One, two, 
three. Okay. How long? How do we form a day? How is a day formed? Somebody, go ahead, Katusha. How? Okay, she says it starts at 12 o'clock midnight and then ends at 12 o'clock, okay. How, how, is the form, how is the day formed? Sun rises, sun sets, okay. What if I told you that the sun doesn't rise and it doesn't set? The sun doesn't rise and it doesn't set. The earth is on an axis of 23.5 degrees. Okay, so let's do this as, 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 right? And you got the sun, and as, and it takes, now it, it goes, which way does the earth spin? The earth spins counterclockwise. And it spins at 2,200 kilometers an hour. And yet, you don't see us doing this. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention. See? Counterclockwise. Now, what happens is the sun stands still and the earth rotates. And the period, and what appears to be sunrise and sunset is the earth coming into contact with the sun or moving out of contact with the sun. So, scientific note, night occurs when a piece of land is away from the presence of the sun. Spiritual application. Night occurs when we are away from the presence of the sun. You remember Nicodemus came to Jesus and it was night? Not just physically, but spiritually for Nicodemus. Now, so God said, let there be light. Now remember, we said that God knows the end from the beginning. Now, God says there was evening and there was morning. The one. And here's the thing about creation that is important to us. So, a day is formed by the earth turning 360, 360 degrees on its axis uh, revolving around the sun, right? That takes 24 hours, right? And at the end of that 24 hours, we have one day. How do we get a month? Come on. The moon? What does the moon do? I heard somebody say, huh? The moon travels around the earth. And it takes approximately 30 days of the moon traveling to get a month. How do we get a week? How do we get a week? Look up, you can, I give you permission now to take your phone out and Google. What? forms a week, or how do we get a week? And you will see some interesting theories. According to Google, the week was given to us by the Babylonians because the Babylonians believe that the moon, a month was actually, a, a lunar month is actually 29 days. 29 days is a lunar month, equals one lunar month. So they rounded it down to 28, but the month was so long, they wanted to break it down into smaller segments. So 
some brilliant Babylonian mathematician decided that 4 goes into 28 seven times. That is a perfect period, and hence we got a week. And I say, poppycock. Because God said he made a week by declaring the seventh day to be the day that he ended his work that from all his work which he had created and which he had made, he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now it's interesting, if you read through this creation narrative, there are only three things that God blessed. He didn't bless everything that he made. It's, it's very interesting. God blessed the creatures of the sea and the fowl of the air. And he told him to be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the earth and let fall multiply. God blessed the man and the woman. And he told him to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And God blessed the seventh day. Now when God blesses you, it means that he's now endued you with power to do the thing which he has blessed you to do. In other words, you're blessed, my friend. We are blessed when we have children because it's an evidence that we have done the thing that God has blessed us to do. God's blessing is, comes from one who is of greater authority to one who is of lesser authority. And in that blessing, he supplies, uh, or I put it this way, in the blessing, it is, it is the idea of rest, prosperity, longevity, all of this is wrapped up in God blessing anything, specifically the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath being the memorial to creation celebrates the omniscience, the God who knows the end from the beginning, that God and only God has given us a seven-day week. In history, they have tried a 10-day week, an 8-day week, a 12-day week, but they have found that only a seven-day week works. So they decided that, well, we only have seven days, but let's change the order. And notice, God didn't give the days names. He gave them numbers. So no matter what day they put on the calendar, as the first day of the week, according to, you know, you, you see calendars now that the first day is Monday. Some is Tuesday. I'm sorry, some is Sunday. Some is Monday. Some of them are Monday. And if, see, if you believe that the week was created by the Babylonians, then you can put the week in any order that you want it to be. So, question for you and me. Paul writes in Hebrews 11, through faith, we understand that the worlds were formed, were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are made of things which do appear. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God made a world in six literal evenings and mornings? Do you believe that you and I are created in the image of God for God's pleasure? Do you believe that the diet given in Genesis 1 is the best? Now, I'm going to wrap up shortly. Back in creation, back in the garden, I want you to consider this. In the beginning, God made man and he put him in a garden. Genesis 2 and verse 8. It says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. He set him up, simply set or appoint this man to live in this garden. And we continue, says, And out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to his sight and good for food, and a tree of life also in the midst of the garden, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the river went out of Eden toward the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And it goes on to name the heads of the rivers. And in verse 15 it says, And the Lord God did what? He did what? And did what? And he did what? He took him and he put him in the garden of Eden 
to dress it and to keep it. Now, in verse 8, he put man, and they use the word sum. For those of you who Strong's Concordance, it's Hebrew word 7760. But in verse 15, he uses a different word, the word yanak. And yanak is used in a causative sense, and it literally means to provide rest or a place of quiet. So when we read verse 15, and it says, The Lord God took man and put him to rest in the Garden of Eden, a place of quiet to dress it and to keep it. It is true that when we spend time in the garden, we find time to rest our minds. It is often amazing how relaxing sitting in a beautifully manicured garden, observing a freshly cut lawn, has that calming effect on us. And you wanted to know why? Well, it is so because God, the eternal God, your creator and mine, made it so. See? You may be wondering, why is it important for us to remember God or to concentrate on God as creator? Because the God as creator is foundational to the gospel. It is the foundation of the gospel because the God who loved the world enough to give his only son to die for the world is the God who made the world and created man in his own image. Male and female to reproduce after their kind. And consider that the decision to provide the gift of his son was a decision that was made before the foundation of the world. And that is why it's important for us to understand and to recognize God as our creator. You see, we are warned in, by Christ in the last days that in the last days, the world will begin to repeat the behaviors of Sodom and Gomorrah and it would live like we lived in the days of Noah. So terrible it was that God had repented of creating man, Genesis 6, 5 and 6. Peter, the apostle, writes in his second epistle, chapter 3, he says, but in the last day, scoffers will come. They will arise and mock the creation narrative. And this is why the message that God has given to his church for the last days, the first message begins by a call to worship a God who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. See, because of this foundation, if you understand that there's a God who made everything that you see, there's a God who made you, then suddenly you are not your own. You recognize that there is an accountability to a power that is higher than yourself. You see, I found something interesting in this month's edition of the Adventist Journey that stated only 23% of church members often apply their faith to political or social issues. That means out of every 10 people here, only 2.3 of us will use our faith when it comes to political and social issues. That, my friend, is a very scary thought. Because we are faced with many political and social issues. Gay marriage, discriminatory immigration policies, Abuse of the poor and disenfranchised. And God has called us to be a light in the darkness of this world which we find ourselves living in. See, the gospel is not simply that Jesus died and paid for my sins, but that the eternal God who created me, who created you in his image, clothed himself with humanity and subjected himself to time and space and death to offer to you and to me Life eternal because he loved us. The messages of the three angels call for us to cry out. It says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Interesting. You know, the wine of Babylon offers many blends, many bottles, 
on the subject of creation. There's the gap theory. There's Darwinian evolution. But most dangerous is theistic evolution. I believe that God created the world, but I'm not sure about those six literal days. Might be six periods of time, six eras. And we are there, we have a blending of the true and the false. And ultimately, imbibing any of these false theories hinders our ability to think clearly and logically about right and wrong. See, these wines drown absolutes and leave an aftertaste of shifting standards and hopelessness. Because for you and me, if we do not believe the primary message that the Bible begins with, that God created the heavens and the earth, we will be powerless in our proclamation that Jesus is the Redeemer of heaven and earth. Friends, creation is important to God. Because it sets him apart. It's the one act that he has done. Well, let me, let, me, let me backtrack on that. It is the one thing that sets God apart from all other gods. And his final act of love would be to create for you and me a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. He says he will destroy this sinful earth and replace it with a new one. Uh, will give us a city and a builder whose maker is God. A garden where rivers of sorry, the rivers of water of life flow freely. A world without night. A city with open gates with no need of the sun because the light of the world will illuminate it. This is the plan of the eternal God who knows the end from the beginning. And there's coming a day, my brothers and my sisters, when we will have to stand before God. Who knows the end from the beginning? And he tells us in the beginning that our end can be secure if we will but put our trust in him. You see, I imagine that at that day, to be held in his arms and to open my eyes and to take in his face. To look in the face of one whose voice I have heard for many, as long as I can remember. Listening for those words that says unto me, unto you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want you to close by turning your, in your Bibles to the, God, to the book of Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah. For those of you who are not very familiar, find the Psalms and then head to the right. You got Isaiah. Then Jeremiah. And it's a passage of scripture that, we've, that we quote often. Jeremiah chapter 29. We often quote verse 11. Jeremiah 29 and 11. Which says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to an expected End. But I want us to read verses 10 through 14 this morning. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 through 14. It says, For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. You see, at the time Jeremiah is writing this letter, God's people are in captivity because of disobedience. They have forsaken the God of creation and have adopted all other gods. They have forgotten the Sabbath. And God has punished them by sending them into captivity. And he writes this saying, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. And there in captivity, then you shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. You know, sometimes in life, God allows us to fall into captive conditions so that we will call on him and pray unto him. And hearken unto him. And he says you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And he goes on to say, and I will be found of you, says the Lord. 
and I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from the, all the nations, from all the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again to the place where I cause you to be carried, from the place, this place, where I cause you to be carried away captive. What does all that mean? God knows the end from the beginning. And maybe this morning in your life you may feel as though you've been carried away captive into some situation, difficulty, habit, whatever it may be. But God's promise to us this morning is this. Call unto me. Pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. But we must do it with our whole hearts. And when we do it, we will be found of the we will be found, we will find that God is there for us. I want you to re, I challenge you today to reread the creation story. But this time, read it with the awareness that the eternal God who made you in his image and after his likeness, who knows the end from the beginning, desires to embrace you in the end and give you a new beginning. Let's stand and sing our closing song, number 111. It was almost, I could almost say it was easier for God to make the world than to make a change in our lives because he didn't have to ask permission. And the stars don't tell him no, and the sun does When God tells the earth to spin, it doesn't say, no, I don't want to spin today. It just spins because that it was, well, that's what it was created to do. And you and I were created for God's pleasure. Let's never forget that. We were created for God's pleasure. And therefore, whatever he asks us to do will be ultimately for our pleasure because God only gives us good gifts. Before we pray, I want you to repeat after me. I am created in the image of God. Those around me are created in the image of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you created us. It was a unique thing that you did. You found use for dust. You formed it, you fashioned it, and you breathed into it the breath of life, and it became an image of who you are. That is the miracle of us. Lord, help us to recognize that you made all of us. And may we, in dealing with each other, recognize, Lord, that we are handling something of divine origin. May we be more careful in our choices, in our speech, in our thoughts. Help us, Father, to guard this image that you have made us into. Help us, Lord, to exemplify who you are to those around us. So help us to be gracious, help us to be merciful, help us to be patient, to be kind, to be loving. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to be forgiving. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would be here with us. And as we leave this place, Lord, help us on this Sabbath day, a day that you have blessed and endued for success, for longevity. Help us to take a moment, Lord, to reflect on your handiwork. To recognize, Lord, that we did not make ourselves. To help us, Lord, to remember that because we did not make ourselves, Lord, one day we have to give an account to you for what we have done with the life you have given to us. By your grace, Father, and your grace only, save us 
in your eternal kingdom. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.